News First, Newsline Prime with Faraz Shaukat Ali. Well, hello there. This is Newsline. Unfortunately, unfortunately, sometimes we do things uh, that are not live. This is a recording, but it's a recording because our guest is a very busy person indeed and plays a dynamic role in something uh, much more important than politics. It, he helps people get on with their lives. And uh, to see what we're talking about, well, let's start talking to him. He's right here in the studio with us, Dr. Karvinder Rajapaksa. Very good. Uh, hello there, uh, Dr. Karvinder. Hello, Faris. How are you? And tell me, Dr. Karvinder Rajapaksa is a plastic surgeon. Why, why the term plastic surgeon? <laughs> yeah, a lot of people ask me that, that actually. It's nothing to do with plastics, I would yeah. say. Uh, in Greek, Plastikos means uh, formation of form and function and uh, the art of surgery which does that is uh, termed as plastic surgery. Right. Actually speaking, plastic surgery was there before the invention of plastic in the world. Right. <laughs> so okay. therefore, it's because of we are involved in the specialty of surgery which uh, involves formation of uh, your form and function. Right. Okay. So that's how the name came about. I see. And, and what, what's the route that one takes to become a plastic surgeon? Uh, in Sri Lanka, actually, we have to first become an a MBBS doctor right. and then further qualify to be uh, a general surgeon. Right. That is about three years and one month of training. Further? Further after, after, the, MBBS. after the MBBS. Right. Then you become a surgeon and then you opt to subspecialize. Right. And that is another four years of training, right. two years of local uh, training as a plastic surgical right. training, trainee, and then you have to go to a developed country to uh, further train for another couple of years. And then when you come back only, you will be uh, qualified as a consultant plastic and a reconstructive surgeon. So, yeah. so altogether about, about ten years. Altogether about uh, seven years surgical training yeah. plus the MBBS. Right. Yes. Okay. I see. So uh, anyone with less than that won't be qualified. Yeah, not in Sri Lanka as, as well as in other countries. It's yeah. sometimes it's further uh, longer. Is this, does this keep you busy every day? Yes, kind of. <laughs> so, so there's a lot of um, what what your work is not. It's actually the opposite of cosmetic, isn't it? Yours is. I am mostly involved in reconstructive surgery. Right. Yeah, but uh, we do cosmetic surgery as well. But that is only part of plastic surgery. Right. Uh, and that is the one which is mostly known to people. Right. But uh, other than that, other than uh, reconstruct uh, cosmetic surgery, we do a lot of reconstructive surgery. Mm. For example, like from the birth itself till somebody passes away, mm. we do all sorts of reconstructions like from birth defects to trauma, accidents and cancer reconstruction as well as uh, burn reconstruction and oh. then uh, when there are, there are acquired deformities where you have industrial injuries and hand injuries oh. as such, so we correct all that to a place where that person can function back in society as well as to give them a better appearance at mm. the same time, not just function form as well. When, when somebody uh, undergoes this, the, the trauma of having to have, let's say, their hands reattached, yeah. uh, some part of their arm or whatever, is, what, what do you think is the greater trauma? Is it, is it the mind over the actual thing? Yeah, that's, that's a very good question for us actually, yeah. because it's, itself it's a very traumatic event. So they have a huge amount of mental trauma, right. which you have to rehabilitate, of course. And then you have the uh, feeling of loss of a limb. Yeah. So once you reattach them, when they see that functioning again, yeah. most of that trauma gets eliminated. Mm. So therefore, it's a short-lived one. Mm. And uh, they, if it, it is compared to not having a hand versus having a hand. Mm. So it's always better to have the hand plus a functioning hand mm. so that they can get back to where they were in their lives before. Mm. So I think uh, most of them, they recover very well. And uh, I know you've come back from uh, Australia yeah. and uh, you've been here. Uh, you've been here since what, 2014? I, yeah, I came back in 2014, January. So 
I'm surprised that you you are uh, kept busy because you know we didn't have a war from 2014. <laughs> the war was all gone. I so when I'm thinking <laughs> reconstructive surgery, my mind's going to the war. Yeah. Uh, Actually, uh, if you consider road traffic accidents alone, yeah. the number of victims we get per day is more than what we got during the war wow. per day. That's a lot. That's a lot. Yeah. So war was actually uh, just a small proportion of what we did. It's yeah. huge, the other amounts. But they were masked during the war. These are all from road traffic accidents? Mostly, right? yeah. Mostly. And then, of course, these cancer patients who need reconstruction after the cancer has been taken off. Right. Then babies born with defects. Right. And uh, burn victims. So all those patients are rehabilitated and reconstructed. Now. Right. Yeah. And um, um, is plastic surgery uh, reconstructive surgery? It's uh, available freely on the, uh, on, under the state system. Yes. Uh, actually, we have all our teaching hospitals in the island. Yeah. They have a plastic surgeon currently uh, covering the whole uh, areas of the country. And uh, then, of course, uh, military hospital, we have plastic surgeons. And But the main thing is now most of our state hospital doctors, almost all, are fully committed to their state uh, uh, commitments and they we do not do a cosmetic procedures pure cosmetic procedures right. in the state sector but uh, everything else we do in the state sector everything is available we'll see is that do, do you need much you know after you've done the uh, reconstruction yeah do you need much a lot of care of of course answer? yes for example if I reattach a hand yeah. My work is of only 50 percent. Okay. Rest of the work is from the patient as well as from the therapist, because that hand needs to work. Right. So if I reattach a hand, if, and if that patient just lies alone with that hand without doing any exercises and rehab, that will be as bad as a not. Oh, so you've got to get the get it going. Get it going, and uh, then there are procedures which we do later on to fine tune, and uh, then uh, the nerves has to grow, so the sensation has to come back. That has to be monitored and the tendons has to function smoothly and the joints have to be mobile till the tendon starts functioning and the nerves take over. Right. So a lot of work after the procedure, yes. Right, yeah. I see. Um, I wonder where, well, I wonder whether we should be, we're going to play some clips, I think, and we, like, we can talk through them. Is that what we're going to do today, control room? There you go. Yeah, that's actually a reattached hand. Right. If you notice, uh, for us, it's all functioning, all the fingers are moving. Yeah. And he has got sensation back as well. Okay. And mind you, this is after nine months of reattaching. After nine, nine months? Nine months, yeah. Okay. So he had to undergo a lot of rehabilitation and okay. exercises to get okay. there. But he's a young chap. Now right. he's take, riding his motorcycle with that hand. Oh. And, and, um, well, how did that happen, can I ask? Yeah, yeah. if I remember correctly, it was a defense injury from a personal uh, fight. Okay. So I think it's a sword cut. Oh. He was defending himself when the sword was Just aimed in, at him. In this case, do you remember, was it, was it completely severed? No, I think there was a small attachment uh, from the thumb side. Right. But everything else was completely cut. It's probably about 95% cut. Right. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So he, he's, he's a happy chappy now, isn't he? He's yes, his, he's quite his, back to his normal his, life. Mm -hmm. And probably riding his motorbike yep. again. <laughs> so that means it's all working. Yes. Um, and then, what would you say? Now, let, let's have a look. Here goes, there's another one here. Yeah, that's actually an interesting uh, uh, patient. Yeah. He had lost his thumb. I think we may have a clip uh, on the still clip where he has this pre-op photo. Yeah. Where he has lost his thumb again with some uh, industrial injury. Right. And he only had the four fingers. I see. And when you consider that kind of an injury, you can't do much with only one planar okay. fingers yeah. because thumb is in the different in a different plane. Right. Which gives you about 80% of hand function. Right. Together. So what I did was I got his index finger and created a new thumb, new thumb. Oh, I see. Yeah, so okay. he's got the thumb and three fingers now. So you need the thumb, don't you, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. very much. Yeah. So now he's got a functioning hand with three fingers and a thumb, right. which is almost as good as, good as at what he had. Right. Wonderful. I mean, he, 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 must, uh, he must be uh, 
he must have a photograph of you and must be watching <laughs> it every morning. Uh, Possibly, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I, I, I hope so, because, you know, doctors, nurses, um, are not really, uh, in my view, they're not appreciated enough. Uh, people must remember that uh, I, I've been, um, I've been treated in National Hospital you know, for a gunshot wound, and uh, the level of service that they, uh, they took was absolutely brilliant. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, I didn't need a Western doctor to tell me mm -hmm. that, but uh, it was superb. Yes. Um, and the, the emergency care was absolutely wonderful. Yes. And even, even the nurses, you know, thereafter, post, and the operation. That's true. They, they, it's obvious that they're doing a job that they want to do. It's not a job. Uh, and, you know, therefore, the level of care, they do it with a lot of uh, passion and yes. seeing. And kindness. You need to be kind, I think. Yes, so that's, that's very true. Yeah. Um, and I, and um, to me, I don't know if uh, uh, the government does enough to pay them and uh, to, uh, to take care of them, because they, they work every little bit. Um, I, I just thought I'd say that, because I wanted to say um, what, what it. What would you say is, how many incidents do you think is happening every day? Oh, a lot. I don't have the statistics at the moment, yeah. but uh, huge amounts. <clears throat> Mainly, most of them are the pathetic uh, stories. They are preventable, okay. especially these road traffic accidents, industrial injuries. All those are because of lack of discipline, yeah. and uh, our guys are not properly, properly trained. Like, in, for example, when I was working in Australia, if you yeah. had to do a carpentry job or a plumbing job, yeah. you had to have three years of uh, training and being an apprentice, like an intern, mm -hmm. then only they will give you license. Mm -hmm. And they check your safety measures, whether there's, if there's no safety in whatever the instrument they are using, they will not even cover it with insurance. Mm -hmm. But in Sri Lanka, we don't have such a strict regulation. So therefore, a lot of these industries happen accidents, mm -hmm. happen because of the negligence mm -hmm. and the non-proper trained, trained uh, uh, occupants of these instruments. Mm -hmm. And do you think that um, the health, I, don't, I don't even know whether we have a health and safety uh, executive. We must have something like that here. Do you think they're not being I'm also not sure about yeah. that, but uh, most of the time, I'll give an example. Yeah. Now, when you have a, like, you know, these big wheels which cuts uh, tea, uh, tree trunks? Yeah. They come with a guard. Right. And most of the time, we don't see the guard because they have removed it for their ease. Uh -huh. And that can easily go and sever your hand. Right. And another example is these uh, three wheelers. Right. They have a lock where they can't turn more than 45 degrees, yeah. so then they don't topple. But most of these are broken mm -hmm. so that they can turn quickly at the same time. So mm -hmm. all these safety measures are there for a reason. But our... Uh, well, well, what is it about us that uh, makes us so flippant when it comes to these things? I think probably it's the lack of regulations and yeah. the strictness. If they are quite strict on those, yeah. I think people will adhere. Because other countries also, there are people who will try to do that. Yeah. But their laws are so strict, they will not even dare. They won't dare. Yeah. Yes, because they respect the rule of law. Yes. Uh, and they're frightened, frightened to break it. And there are consequences. Yeah. They might not be covered by their insurance. Yeah. And they might not be taken to the state hospitals. Like mm. if, if it is accidental, not pure accidental, they will have consequences. Yeah. There you go. Uh, on that note, we're going in for a short break. Don't go away. After all, this is Newsline. News first. Newsline Prime with Araz Shaukatali. And welcome back to Newsline. We're in conversation with Dr. Karvinder Rajapaksa. Uh, he is a plastic surgeon. Uh, also, better uh, probably that's the best way you know. But otherwise, you're known as a reconstructive surgeon, is it? Yeah, it goes, both goes together, actually, plastic and reconstructive surgery. Oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> now then, what would you say is the... We, we've, we've spoken um, that the reconstructive part of it is keeping you busy every day. Uh, what about the cosmetic angle of what plastic surgeons can do? Uh, yeah, it's, it's like this. It's most of the 
patients we get, or, or I wouldn't say patients sometimes, uh, the person who comes to us, they have some problem with their appearance or something of them, which mm -hmm. is, is not giving them enough confidence for their day-to-day -day life. Uh -huh. So that's again kind of like a stressful event for that person. Mm -hmm. It's not purely just uh, getting yourself looking nice. Yeah. For example, if somebody has a, a little bit of a crooked nose, yeah. he may not be uh, going into the society straight uh, with a straight head because right. he's quite uh, conscious. conscious about his I appearance. So that kind of individual will easily can get that corrected mm -hmm. by coming to a plastic surgeon and, and then that will build a lot of confidence in him and that person will have a better quality of life, I suppose. Mm. So it's not always just a pure uh, need, but there is an element of uh, illness as well. Right. Um, I was just thinking about this. So how big is the... Uh, do we have loads of uh, plastic surgeons in Sri Lanka? Yeah, we've got, we've got loads actually. We've got 15 of them. <laughs> 15? That's all? That's all. Oh At the moment, we have 15 qualified consultant plastic surgeons. No wonder surgeons. you're busy. <laughs> yes, and we've got so, about seven, eight trainees under training, and uh, then there are acting plastic surgeons also. But uh, at the moment, uh, we are in quite a few numbers. Mm. I mean, for an example, if I consider where I worked in Australia, yeah. that department itself had 12 plastic surgeons. Right. So for the whole country, we have 15, and the Australian population is the same as ours. Indeed. And this was only a state hospital, oh, South Australia. Gosh. Yeah. Amongst other, many other hospitals which had more plastic surgeons. So Maybe these statistics ought to be used by the Department of uh, Motor Traffic <laughs> and uh, put big billboards up and say so that people will drive a little bit more carefully. If they want it properly reconstructed back, yes. Yes, yeah. <laughs> That's a good um, And um, but do you get instances where uh, cosmetic surgery is done, pure cosmetic surgery is done uh, in the state? No, no. State does not fund, uh, fund for cosmetic, pure cosmetic surgery. So for that you need to go to the private sector. Private sector. Yeah. Yeah. Do we have enough of a big private sector here? Or? Uh, we do have. Actually speaking, all these uh, qualified plastic surgeons are the ones who does in the private sector as well, oh, after hours of their government service. Right. So it's limited. Uh, so the market is still limited. Yes. Probably explains why there's a net outbound uh, people who go out of the country for the yeah. cosmetics. Yes, uh, true. But actually speaking, now it's the other way around. A lot of people come to Sri Lanka to get it done. Okay. Because they find it much cheaper and they can uh, probably enjoy Sri Lanka as well. Yeah. So yes, it's turning the other way around and our plastic surgeons are also quite uh, skillful. So they have been like quite proving themselves more than, better than sometimes yeah, in other right. countries like our neighbor countries. So we have given a good quality service so far. And um, uh, do, do you think that uh, this is a, uh, another industry in the making, the, it's sort of medical tourism? <laughs> That's a very interesting question. It's already an industry in some way yeah. for us because now we have a few 15 or a few qualified guys. Yeah. And, and because of that, some have got an advantage. Right. And then there are places where there are no qualified plastic surgeon, but cosmetic surgery is being performed mm -hmm. in the country. So that kind of uh, opening up of avenues have become a fashion lately because of yeah. the lack of uh, plastic surgeons. I see. I, I, maybe that, that may be one reason, I don't know. Right. So we, we, uh, do you think that it's, um, do we have enough regulation? That's a difficult question to answer. Right. <laughs> but yes, yes uh, no, it's like this. If you are to practice surgery in our country, yeah. the regulation is if you have an MBBS, yeah. as a basic doctor, you can. Right. So you are uh, safe. Right. But I am advising the patients or the person who seeks the help of a plastic surgeon to go through the uh, websites where we have all these uh, qualified uh, uh, guys are enlisted in the, for example, uh, SLMC website has, then the post graduate Institute of Medicine website has the and list so of... So you can check if they... Check if they are qualified. Right. So yeah. if they've done their three and a half years and four yeah. years and so on. Because the, the list is there. Yeah. These are the board certified qualified plastic surgeons. Right. So anybody who is not in that list is not a qualified plastic surgeon in Sri Lanka. 
And um, Dr. Kavin Rajpaksa, um, do, you, do you, you need any special skills apart from being able to become a doctor, which is a special skill in its own self? But then thereafter, do you? I, I doubt it. I'm a plastic surgeon. <laughs> Okay. Uh, no, it's like this. Uh, you was there anything in your youth that you did that you knew? Well, this guy is going to become a, pl uh, a surgeon. Mm. Were you a good artist? Were you what? I I, I do uh, paintings. Right. Yeah. Yes, it will help if you are a artistic fellow, right. because plastic surgery is all about reconstruction, right. sculpturing. Right. You're basically sculpturing your body, right. putting back things together, making it work, right. and you have to have the 3D concepts. Right. And uh, when, I, for example, when I'm harvesting a flap, I yeah. should uh, have the picture in my head that that is going to be enough to cover the defect the other oh. surgeon or the cancer surgeon has caused. Right. So these all will help if you have an artistic uh, right. background. Should right. Should be a bit maybe a bit You'll be better than the others then. <laughs> right. And I want to ask you this. I think maybe we're coming to the end of our, our uh, time. If Dr. Christian Barnard was the uh, godfather of uh, open heart surgery. He's, being, he's credited with being the first uh, to have done uh, heart surgery uh, from South Africa, of course. Then, in that, in, if he was the godfather of the uh, of uh, the cardio world, uh, then who would you say is the uh, godfather or the mentor uh, plastic surgeon in, in this? Yeah, actually, uh, when you consider modern plastic surgery. Sir Harold Gillis is the father of plastic surgery right. and uh, then if you consider the whole of medicine, mm. Sushruta, who was an Indian surgeon in 600 BC, first performed plastic surgery. 600 BC? BC, yeah. yeah. There is documented evidence right. and papers published by Sushruta doing a nasal reconstruction, rhinoplasty, causing right. a, making a nose wow. for a person who has chopped off his nose as a punishment, so he has created a nose with uh, using the arm and oh. a flap. So that was the first documented uh, plastic surgery done in the history of uh, medicine. Goodness me. Yeah, so he is considered as the father of plastic surgery in all time. And uh, then probably uh, Harold Gillis. Harold Gillis is the modern plastic surgery. So he's the contemporary equivalent. Yes. Right. <laughs> well, you know, Dr. Karan Rajapaks, uh, thank you ever so much for agreeing to come on. Newsline. Thank you so much. And uh, to join the many who've passed through the studio, uh, award-winning authors, politicians, of course, by the score, and uh, uh, members of the public, and the people who are very civic-minded, and of course, Dr. Kavit Rajapaksa. So thank you ever so much, because you're obviously doing a uh, much-needed and wonderful job. We, uh, may God bless you and give you further um, courage to go ahead and do even more. Right. Thank, Thank you, you so very much. much. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. And that's the way it was on Newsline. We trust you enjoyed the difference, and we certainly did. Take care, and God bless you. News First, Newsline Prime with Araz Shaukatali.